to this May meeting of the Pyrenees Shire Council. As the meeting chair, I give my support for this open council meeting to be streamed live, recorded and published online. Anyone who is invited to read out a question or a presentation will be recorded and their voice, image and comments will form part of the live stream and recording. The chair and or the CEO have the discretion and authority at any time to direct the termination or interruption of live streaming. Such direction will only be given in exceptional circumstances where deemed relevant. Circumstances may include instances where the content of debate is considered misleading, defamatory, or potentially inappropriate to be published. The stream will stop prior to the closed section of the meeting and will recommence at the conclusion of the meeting. The public is able to view this live stream via our website at www.pyrenees.vic.gov.au. Should technical issues prevent a continuation of the stream, a recording will be made available and on our website. Please stand for the opening prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask you to give your blessing to this council, direct and prosper its deliberations to the advancement of your glory and the true welfare of the people of the Pyrenees Shire. Amen. Amen. We acknowledge the people past and present of the Wadabarong, Jarjabarong, Eastern Ma and Wachabolic tribes whose land forms the Pyrenees Shire. We pay our respect to the customs, traditions and stewardship of the land by the elders and people of these tribes on whose land we meet today. Um, councillors or others, any notices of interest, disclosure of interest? Councillor? Thanks, Mr Mayor. If I could just disclose that I have an interest in the Western Vic Transmission Network in that I am an affected landholder. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Confirmation of the previous minutes that the minutes of the ordinary meeting of council held on the 19th of April, 2022, and the closed meeting of council held on the 19th of April, 2022, as previously circulated to councillors be confirmed. Moved councillor Ferrari, seconded councillor Keogh. All those in favour? Carried. Is there any business arising from those minutes? No business arising. Thank you, councillors. Public submissions. Members of the public may present a submission to council in the period immediately following public question time. Members of the public may attend the meeting in person to verbally make a submission. All attendees are asked to register by midday on the day of the meeting. To register, call 1300 797 363 or visit the website. Members of the public who are unable to attend in person to make a submission on an agenda item may do so in writing, either online through Council's website, by mail or hand delivered. The Chair will allocate a maximum of five minutes to each person who wishes to address Council. Submissions are to be received by 12 noon of the day of the meeting. There will be no discussion or debate with the public attendees. However, councillors may ask questions for clarification of the attendee. Tony, I believe you'd like to make a submission. Could you stand up, Captain Mark? Yeah. Oh, I was just here today just to observe uh, the information on the power line. You know, I was just a bit interested in see uh, how far that had come and what the Shire uh, know about it is. So, is that is that okay to to sit in up here and? Yes, yes, yes cer right. certainly. It's one of the items on the agenda that we'll oh, be going okay. through. Oh, great. So is that okay if yep. I sit in on that? Yep, by all means. Thanks, very Thanks much. Tony. <laughs> Councillors, on the items for noting, are there any questions? Councillor Clark. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. Just one question I assume to the CEO. The EES submissions have now closed. Do we have any kind of sense of when this next stage of the process might be concluded and that the final yes, I assume is the next stage is released? Mr Nolan? 
Uh, thank you, Councillor Clark. Um, my understanding is that the uh, uh, is submissions have closed. They closed last Friday and Council made a submission um, and uh, that submission is uh, accessible on our website. Um, uh, my understanding is now that the, uh, uh, the, the department will um, uh, seek to inform the minister who will look to establish a panel to hear submissions. Um, under normal circumstances with an EES, that uh, panel would convene, or they look convene that at a local level. So, um, uh, uh, but that would be determined by the minister. Um, in terms of uh, timing, that's uh, really at the minister's discretion at this stage, but uh, it usually takes a couple of months before that gets underway, um, uh, I would expect. Uh, and it, it might depend on how many submissions have been received. But um, uh, it's understood that uh, the normal EES um, process, the, the submissions that are made would be made uh, available for public access um, soon after the close of submissions as well. So we look to, to do that. And uh, once we actually have any further advice, uh, Councillor, we will look to communicate that through our social media channels just to keep people informed about uh, the opportunity to uh, stay involved. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This report is presented for Council to consider placing the draft 10-year asset plan on public exhibition. The Local Government Act requires Council to develop an asset management plan. The plan must include information about maintenance, renewal, acquisition, expansion, upgrade, disposal, and decommissioning in relation to each class of infrastructure asset. Council must develop and review the plan in accordance with deliberative engagement practices and adopt the plan by 1st of July uh, this year. The requirement for deliberative engagement in relation to these, this first plan has been waived. The 10-year asset plan is prepared in consideration of the council plan, uh, which was developed for the 21-25 uh, council period. And in particular, uh, priorities associated in that plan related to road infrastructure to support connectivity for community and commerce, and also address priorities um, enabling council to deliver a wide range of services to the community and the broader general public. The plan sets out a range of asset management principles. It presents key objectives of asset management, being the forward planning of asset renewal works, to ensure service standards are maintained and that the cost of asset renewal is equitably distributed across the life of the plan. The purpose of the 10-year asset plan is to reduce council's financial risk through linking the forward planning of asset renewal to council's 10-year financial plan. This will ensure expenditure on renewal works aligns with council's resource allocation. The re renewal of assets also manages and reduces risk associated with asset impairment and failure. The draft 10-year asset plan is provided for public exhibition. Therefore, it's the officer recommendation that council places the draft 10-year asset plan on public exhibition and that a report be presented to council at the June 2022 council meeting to consider adoption of the 10-year asset plan, taking into account any submissions received. Thank you, Mr. Gowers. Councillors, we have a report. Do I have a mover? Councillor Clark, seconded. Councillor Ferrari. Councillor Clark. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is a pretty significant document in the context of things for a small rural council, particularly where our biggest asset, and I'll use that word a bit loosely, is roads, and we have 2,000 kilometres of them. This details really well the work that we have to do. Mr. Gowns, 
I'm most impressed with the fact that we focus on what we need to spend on behalf of the community. I think that really is what we talk about because the challenge I think for us when we talk about this as an asset plan is that when you actually look at the list of assets that are here, um, sealed roads, bridges and culverts, curbed channels, swimming pools, waterways, dams and boards, I don't think any of those are particularly saleable. They're actually, although we call them assets, they are effectively obligations that we look after on behalf of our community. Uh, and in this sense, I think this is a really good public document about what our plans are for the coming years and highlighting the things that we see we need to do, things like swimming pools, uh, investments in community facilities, all that's in the document. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Park. Any other councillors? I'd, I'd like to commend uh, this document to the public. It's a very readable document. It's been created purposefully that way by the staff so that it's not the sort of document that you could think, oh, I couldn't possibly understand that. And I know that because I can understand it. So from that point of view, anybody that wants to understand the implications of what Councillor Clark just said, these are the things that we have to maintain and look after for you it's a very readable document, and I propose it's something you should look at if you're interested. Um, Councillors, all those in favour? Carried. Thank you. Item 13.1.2, Gardners Lane, Snake Valley, two lot subdivision. Mr Gowan. Thank you, Mr Mayor. The purpose of this report is to provide council with information that is relevant to making a determination on planning permit application for a two lot subdivision at Gardner's Lane Snake Valley. Council has received a planning permit application seeking permission for the subdivision of a four hectare lot into two two hectare lots. Both proposed lots front Gardner's Lane to the north, which currently provides legal and physical access. The proposed subdivision is subject to a planning permit under clause 35.03-3 of the Rural Living Zone and clause 44.06-2 of the Bushfire Management Overlay. The property slopes northeast and has a watercourse forming the northeast corner of the lot. Notice was sent to seven neighbouring uh, landowners and public notice was also provided through Council's website two submissions were received. The first submission sought an administrative, administrative correction to the application details, which has now been undertaken and is no longer relevant to the assessment of this application. Further, the submitter has added, we have no issues with the possibility of having the land developed and possibly new neighbours. Submission so two raises a range of concerns relating to the proposed subdivision, including the protection of a drainage line and surface water impacts on a neighbouring dam, ambiguous and inconsistent application and plans, perceived misrepresentation of road condition, no land capability assessment included in the application to demonstrate site's capability to sustain potential developments, a loss of productive agriculture, and a building envelope and environmental setbacks. In reply to submission two, the applicant provided a written response to the concerns raised. However, most of the items are listed remain unsolved for the, unresolved for the submitter. In consideration of the application and the submissions received, the assessing officer has articulated in this report uh, the following responses, and these include, the status of the watercourse drainage line remains as defined by the state as a minor watercourse, and for the consideration of all future developments will be treated as a watercourse. This means that any setback requirements that relate to potential development, including the on-site treatment of, of wastewater, will apply. A land capability assessment has not been requested by council to support the making of this application as the proposed lots are of a size which will support the on-site treatment of wastewater. Council does not require details as to the location of existing fencing and gates in order to assess the application for a planning permit. 
The Rural Living Zone seeks to provide for residential use in a rural environment. The zone's reference to agriculture is not necessarily intended to provide for agricultural land, but rather to ensure that any agricultural use of the land does not impact nearby land users, including residential use. The proposed subdivision allows for suitably located rural <coughs> residential growth, particularly within the rural living zone of Snake Valley. The proposed subdivision is a suitable planning outcome for the area and is compatible with adjoining and nearby land uses. The proposed lots are serviced by an existing road network and are considered to be capable of accommodating future developments, including the ability to treat and dispose of wastewater on site, maintain a potable water supply and accommodate electricity connectivity. The proposed subdivision provides for an appropriate deep densification of residential use in accordance with the objectives of the zone. The proposed lot sizes, whilst meeting the minimum lot sizes specified within the zone, are in keeping with the existing pattern of development within the area. In conclusion, the proposed subdivision accords with the objectives of the Pyrenees planning scheme, specifically the rural living zone and the applicable state and local planning policies. The matters raised in the objections generally relate to activities that are not regulated by the scheme or the Planning and Environment Act and are not relevant to the application currently before Council. Therefore, it's the officer's recommendation that Council determines to issue a notice of decision to grant a planning permit under the provisions of the Pyrenees Planning Scheme for the two lot subdivision at lot two on plan of subdivision 830576P, Gardeners Lane, Snake Valley, subject to conditions. Thank you, Mr. Gowns. Councillors, do I have a mover? Councillor Clark, seconder. Councillor Ferrari. Any discussion, councillors? Uh, Mr. Mayor, can I start with some questions first, please? Certainly. If I could. Um, Mr. Gowans, the first part of the recommendation talks about uh, the waterway and the effect of having to change the building envelopes back to 30 metres. Does, does that mean that we'll have, on that right-hand block, we'll have a longer building envelope or does that create issues with the BMO in the sense of that or will it simply be a smaller building envelope? Uh, through you, Mr. Mann, thank you, Councillor Clark, for your comment. The building envelope would remain as displayed. However, the development would need to ensure that any on-site wastewater treatment would meet the requirements of the separation distance to the waterway. So therefore, there may be a number of ways to address that. So the building envelope can still be used, but it would be about where the um, potential septic system would be located within that envelope. Um, so, so the building envelope would re remain as displayed in the um, advertised documents. Thank you. And knowing that the building envelope is three and a half thousand square metres, it's, it's about a third of a hectare, it's quite significant. Um, the second, the second question is in terms of um, the waterway. I, I did have a look at it and I found it hard to understand that it is a waterway. It is a bit of a depression in the paddock where the water runs, but I fully understand that we have to work by the rules in this sense, hence that the way that we've addressed it in the context, if it's on a map, that is effectively the categorisation that we have to work with. Is that fair? Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, that's absolutely correct. And I, I do understand that this is the top part of a catchment. Uh, so therefore it was, is the, the very beginning of a, a waterway. And the landowner does have um, the ability to um, ha have the water course reviewed uh, by the relevant catchment management authority. Um, if they're strongly of the view that uh, that the waterway has been misinterpreted in, in any sense. So there is still opportunities for the, the landowner to um, uh, dispute the, the, uh, the mapping of that waterway. Um, but from a council officer assessment point of view, we've got to take uh, what is put before us in the um, state maps of waterways. Thank you. And one more, please, Mr. Mayor, if I could. Uh, the final one, having had a look at the road, it's a very serviceable road. It's not particularly wide. Um, and there's a fairly new house on the other side, a new house right next door, another two lot subdivision. There will become a stage where council would simply look at this road and 
deal with it in the normal process of its asset upgrades if it needed to be made better or wider, wouldn't it, Mr Gowns? Thank you for your further question. And, and absolutely, Council looks at all its road assets and the classification status. And the classification status may change depending upon the amount of dwellings within the road, which um, often changes our service level in terms of inspections and grading and maintenance. Um, another consideration uh, for any road within the Shire, especially in a location like this, would be access to um, emergency vehicles, which obviously can access the, the current laneway, uh, but also um, waste and recycling uh, vehicles that would, would need to service those properties as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your indulgence, Mr Mayor. Uh, it's a pretty simple application. It's in a very, very logical spot and we want more people in Snake Valley, the more the better we can get in that sense. It's in line with something we passed very similarly, not very far away last month and I fully support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Anyone else? All those in favour, Councillors? Carried. Thank you. 13.2, fees and charges, hubs in Avoca. Mr Noel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as councillors are aware, uh, with the support of the state government and council's own funds, council has developed two community spaces in Avoca for community and business use. Um, they are uh, you know, really attractive uh, spaces for people to work from um, and uh, comprise uh, a number of uh, multi-purpose uh, um, spaces for office and other use. Um, however, council is required to actually establish uh, a fee schedule for the use of these um, before we um, enter into any uh, agreements for uh, hire of these facilities. And the report in front of you actually provides um, some details around those facilities and the floor plans for each of the, of the buildings um, and a fee structure that uh, relates and uh, because these are uh, newly renovated facilities, there is a, a certain amount of uh, leeway in there to um, enable uh, the likes of a startup business to be able to uh, um, occupy a site and for uh, discounted commercial rates to be uh, applicable to provide encouragement for uh, startup businesses, for example, um, to operate out of the facility and also uh, rates for uh, community use as well. Um, so council, there's a recommendation there that council adopts the higher rates for the spaces and meeting rooms at the two Avoca hub facilities as detailed in this report, and that the fees be effective from the 1st of July, 2022, and that the CEO be authorised to negotiate any other arrangements uh, needed having regard to the adopted fees. Thank you, Mr. Noel. Councillors. Happy to move, Mr Chief. Moved Councillor Vance, seconded Councillor Keogh. Councillor Vance. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, with both these buildings, Council has seen the initiative to spend quite a deal of money bringing it up to a situation where we've got hubs that are available for the wider community. Uh, it would be, in my opinion, uh, a wise move to offer some incentives to people to start the use of these buildings. I'm more than happy to see the CEO be giving the authority, given the authority to negotiate with people that want to go in. Um, I'm sure that there's been a great deal of comparisons done around similar situations around our neighbouring shores. And I think these figures that are presented in the document are quite reasonable, so I'm more than happy to support the motion, Mr Chair. Thank you, Councillor Vance. You, uh, in your history, would have actually been in them as council officers. I might have, I might have almost been the last mayor short of three months to uh, actually <laughs> sit in those offices. Any other discussion, councillors? Councillor Ferrari? Oh, just to... Um... Uh, Councillor Vance all but covered it, I think, but just a, a question for Mr Nolan in relation to the, um, the fees and rates, which I think are really reasonable. 
Um, they weren't just uh, arrived at, were they? There was some comparisons and uh, done across the state and to, to try and get it as fair and equitable for that facility um, as possible and, and reasonable for people to up, uptake those um, rooms, et cetera. Is that right, Mr Knight? Uh, yes. Thanks, Councillor Ferrari. That's correct. Um, we uh, obtained uh, an independent valuation, um, um, a market appraisal of the rental, uh, and the figure for the um, community, new community hub facility was uh, uh, 37500 I believe, um, for the entire space. Uh, and then uh, that was used as a baseline figure to, uh, to arrive at the figures that are there. Um, we also obtained um, through uh, uh, Ms Balker uh, some comparative fees for office spaces and community meeting rooms in a number of other uh, councils and small towns in, um, in the vicinity. Uh, so, yes, there, there's some good comparisons there. Thank you. And no other discussion. Councils, I'll move the motion. Those in favour? Thank you. Thank you. 13.2.2, MAV membership and rural changes. Mr. Norman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and uh, the, the title of this um, and the purpose of this, uh, Mr. Mayor, is to look at MAV membership and rural, rural changes, not rural changes. Um, and the reason for rural, rural changes is because there is a set of rules uh, that um, outlines how the MAV operate. Um, now, the MAV is the peak organisation uh, representing local governments across uh, Victoria. It's a membership-based association. And the role of the M MAV is to represent and advocate for local government's interests, to promote the role of local government, to build the capacity of councils, to facilitate effective networks, to provide policy and strategic advice, support councillors, provide insurance and procurement services. And uh, the rules that, uh, that uh, govern how the MAV operate are currently under review. There is a process uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Philip Shanahan has been engaged to undertake the review. Uh, the process commenced with a, dis directions pa a discussion paper and uh, we now have a directions paper Mr. Mayor, which has been circulated to councils and available uh, for public access. Written submissions are invited up until the 30th of May um, and uh, changes to the rules will be determined by the State Council meeting in September. Um, in addition to the rules review, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, there is a State Council meeting um, on the 24th of June and under ordinary circumstances, uh, individual councils, uh, member councils are invited to submit any uh, motions to the State Council. It's not suggested at this point in time that Council put forward any motions, but uh, uh, that's something that uh, the council, council might consider. Uh, in respect of the rules review, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, uh, the Mayor and the CEO have recently discussed, uh, discussed this and there's been a range of engagement that's undertaken across the sector. Um, some of the rule changes um, address matters relating to the president's term and the tenure, the election of the board, uh, the term and tenure of members, uh, board performance and accountability, state council making policy, voting, high standards of ethical behaviour and discontinuing MAV financial membership. Um, now, the direction from Council sought as to how it, uh, if it uh, would like to make some feedback, and it is recommended that, uh, that the CEO provides feedback on the MAV rules via the online survey following consultation with the Mayor. Um, and of course, we have the President of the MAV, who is uh, one, of, one among us uh, at the moment, is uh, able to provide some further um, advice around the rules and the process. Um, and I'm sure he will have something further to say about that. Uh, but perhaps before I do um, hand back to council, I'll also make mention of the fact that one of the important roles of the MAV is to, uh, to work with uh, the national peak organisation, which is uh, ALGA. Um, and, uh, and one of the important functions of ALGA is to represent its um, uh, combined members uh, in advocating to the Commonwealth for 
uh, a range of things, including funding that uh, is essential for the operation of councils. Now, uh, this council relies heavily on funding from the Commonwealth through the federal assistance grants, through um, roads to recovery funding, through bridges to renewal programs, uh, through the local road and community infrastructure program, which has been a, a more recent initiative of the Commonwealth. And the funding levels that we currently have and enjoy at the moment are, are in part uh, due to the strong advocacy of that peak organisation. And uh, the MAV and the MAV's president has a role uh, on ELGA in terms of doing that advocacy work. And uh, I'd just like to highlight this in the context of a, a federal election, which is only days away, um, and perhaps encourage council to um, provide some um, positive support for ALBA by adopting um, a motion that effectively does that, that it, it demonstrates council's support for the national funding priorities of, uh, of ALGA, which would contribute approximately $6.46 billion per year to Australian GDP and create 43,444 jobs, which is uh, uh, figures that have arrived at based on uh, a range of uh, work undertaken by ALGA. And that council also agrees to support and participate in ALGA's advocacy for their endorsed national funding priorities. Um, and uh, express the support for elders front funding priorities, identify local priorities and programs that would be uh, progressed with the additional financial assistance from the federal uh, government being sought through ELGA and seek funding commitments from members, candidates and their parties um, uh, of these identified local programs by writing to federal members of parliament at the moment. So whilst the um, election is only days away, um, Mr Mayor, it is important that um, we demonstrate strong support for the work of ELGA um, uh, through this process, because um, once the election is determined, ELGA's role will be working with the new, newly elected government to uh, ensure that the, the promises and the commitments made are enacted and um, uh, in, the, in the coming year and beyond. So, Mr Mayor, I'll add that um, uh, uh, as part of my recommendation uh, for Council to consider uh, that level of support. Um, and with those words, Mr Mayor, I'll hand over to, uh, to councillors. Thank you, Mr Nolan. Can I have a move? and seconder to include the additional recommendation Mr. Nolan has put forward. Yeah. Move, Councillor Hayes. Seconder. Councillor Ferrari. Okay, so the recommendation that we'll provide feedback through the CEO and we support the ELGA recommendation. Any discussion, Council? I think first and foremost, we uh, very importantly support the MAV, Mr. Mayor. The MAV is our peak body and it's important for all councils, all 78 of us, I believe, to fall in and support the peak body. Um, they go out and advocate for us. And at the end of the day, you've, you've got to have somebody that's prepared to stand up to Big Brother and put the point across. Uh, and if it happens to be at Alga, uh, the Victorian section of uh, municipal associations has got to be represented. I'm sure the other states will have their say, but we need a strong voice in Victoria and this is our opportunity to support them. So more than happy to support the motion. Thank you, Councillor Vance. Any other discussion? Councillor Clark? You just turn on. Yeah, and thanks, Mr. Mayor. I think it is just to follow on from Councillor Vance's comments. Um, like we're a fairly small fish in the Victorian pond of 79, but we're an even smaller fish in this national pond of 537. So the fact that we we do do this stuff is really important. And I think if you look at what's in the federal election campaign, the financial assistance grants, which are about $4 million, worth about $4 million to us out of our $20 million budget. Uh, roads, which is the essence of what we do, most of our work, disaster relief, climate adaptation, they're all things that are really critical to us as a council. 
just in terms of the actual MOV rules, certainly the one um, that's probably worth us being aware of is that there is a proposal that we reduce the size of the board. So there will be one rural representative go and one metropolitan one, and that will likely change our region in the sense of the region that we're in, that we vote in in that context. So that's just something to be aware of, I think, in that sense of things. The other one that is really critical is that all the councils can be there on the 24th of June to vote and give us a very clear direction on which way we go. So that's the other one that's very important. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Any further discussion? Um, as the recommendation as stated, please, councillors, all those in favour? Carried. Thirteen point two point three, Australian Local Government Association National General Assembly. Mr. Nong. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and that's a, a bit of a segue into the next uh, item. Um, and the purpose of this item is for council to to seek to approve the uh, the uh, mayor and the director of corporate services to attend the uh, Alga National General Assembly in Canberra. Uh, on the 19th to the 22nd of June uh, this year. Uh, and of course, we've just sort of spoken about the, um, the importance of ALGA and the advocacy work they do. Uh, this also, uh, it was also a, a whole national uh, agenda. Um, and uh, there's a general assembly that occurs uh, in Canberra each year. Um, and this year, the theme of the, the conference is uh, Partners in Progress. Um, and it has been the tradition of this council to participate in that annual conference to um, uh, ensure that um, uh, that uh, council uses the opportunity to uptake a range of advocacy work and also um, uh, in conjunction with the Central Highlands Council to, um, to take the opportunity to engage with any MPs and ministers that uh, there might be an opportunity to, to do so whilst in Canberra. Um, and that group has in the past been successful in advocating um, through that process. But uh, more importantly, it's, it's, it's important uh, for, um, you know, the national agenda and the issues that are affecting councils nationally is something that uh, this council needs to have awareness of. Um, and it is an opportunity to, uh, to ensure that there is um, good awareness and also the opportunity to... Uh, to engage and network with uh, with other councils, which has always sort of been found to be very valuable, um, uh, both to officers and to the mayor. Um, and uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, the, the reason why the uh, the director of corporate uh, uh, and community <coughs> services is uh, recommended to attend this is because I will be uh, looking to take uh, some leave around that time. Uh, so, Mr. Mayor, the recommendation is that Council supports the participation of the Mayor and the Director of Corporate Community Services to attend the Elgar National General Assembly and Conference uh, to be held on the 19th to the 22nd of June 2022. Thank you, Mr. Nolan. You'll do anything to get out of going to Canberra in winter. <laughs> Councillors, do I have a mover? Councillor Clark, seconded. Councillor Keogh. Any discussion, councillors? No, I'll put the motion. All those in favour, carry. 13.2.4, Western Victorian Transmission Network Project Update. Mr. Noll. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the purpose of this report is for Council to consider any further actions it wishes to take in respect of the uh, West Vic Transmission Network project. Um, and uh, the report contains a little bit of background to the project and, um, and I won't go through that in detail because I think generally speaking, the community and Council are, are pretty aware, well aware of the project. And the fact that there, uh, there is a range of information that's available both on the Osnet project uh, website, and also uh, just in respect of the Stop the Osnet Towers uh, group, um, which is a, a community group against the construction parameters of the uh, of the project, a range of information available on their website, which provides uh, a range of uh, information and concern around aspects of this project. 
Um, and that's, that's publicly available. Um, also note that uh, just um, this week, Osnet services have uh, launched an online engagement room on their uh, their website, and I do encourage members of the community to uh, to have a look at that. This uh, uh, information is presented in a new format, um, uh, and of course, one of the uh, previous uh, recommendations of council has been to uh, encourage the community to stay informed about issues uh, affecting the community that. Uh, uh, relevant to the project. Um, importantly, uh, Council, it's uh, uh, part of the purpose of this report is just to um, identify and acknowledge the fact that in Council's engagement, not just with the community, um, but with Osnet and with Stop the Osnet Towers, um, there has been a range of um, issues that keep circulating and a range of concerns around the project. And a number of those concerns are, are dot pointed in this report in, in the summary format. Um, and, uh, and one of those relates to the uh, RIT-T process and the concern about the uh, level of engagement that was undertaken with that RIT-T process. And certainly the SAP group have some concerns about that. Uh, the proposal to build an above ground transmission line um, and the, uh, the option of an underground um, uh, transmission uh, is something that uh, has been controversial, uh, both with uh, councils, the community and, uh, and in uh, Osnet's response. Certainly Osnet have uh, come back with a, a position statement and a fact sheet on their website uh, that responds to the uh, uh, Moorable Shire um, a commissioned report which uh, identified that an underground DC option was a feasible option. Uh, and that continues to remain a, a concern amongst members of the community. Uh, the decision to uh, revert the western section of the, the line from a 220 kV line to a 500 kV line has also um, uh, been met with some concern. Concern in as much that, uh, uh, that uh, the 220 kV line capacity um, may not be sufficient um, to meet the objectives and provide the benefits uh, that are needed and that a further project uh, might be in the wings uh, soon after the, uh, the line is, um, this project is delivered. Um, and the other observation with that is that it it has resulted in the need for a terminal station in Hepburnshire, which has actually also raised a range of concerns in that community. Um, land access by Osnet contractors over recent months um, has also been a, a, a factor and council has received some uh, concern in, from landowners in respect of, uh, of that process. And part of what's incorporated into that also is, uh, is the issue around compensation um, as a result of the impacts um, of, the, uh, of the project on particularly the ability of uh, farmers to um, uh, undertake agricultural activities. Um, very mindful that uh, Osnet is undertaking a range of work at the moment, um, technical work, to um, understand the impacts. Um, and those are things like the visual impacts, the agricultural impacts, the cultural heritage, the environmental and uh, habitat risks, the fire and emergency risks, the social and economic risks, the bushfire and emergency risks, et cetera. And uh, these are all matters that are currently under investigation or under um, 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 being worked through with, by Osnet uh, services and uh, and there are a range of sort of concerns that have been expressed to council around some of those things. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, it's not it's not surprising that I should present a report which identifies some of the concerns because these concerns have been expressed by the community over um, several months. Uh, in fact, over the life of the project, um, the project uh, um, it has been extended, um, and so the report on the EES now will be. Um, tabled later in the year rather than um, uh, earlier. Um, and that, that was a decision to provide a uh, better opportunity for Osnet to 
be able to undertake the work that's necessary to uh, understand those uh, those impacts and to do that technical work that's, uh, that's needed. Um, and to that extent, that is, uh, that's been uh, positive to, uh, to extend that period to allow that to occur. Um, however, Mr. Mayor, on the basis of the uh, engagement that's been had to date, um, it is my recommendation that council rides to the Minister for Planning um, highlighting the range of community concerns that have been raised with the project. Um, two, that council continues to keep informed and to share information with the community, uh, including by holding a public meeting at an appropriate time in Warborough. Um, uh, and I'm mindful there that there have been a range of uh, meetings previously held in Warborough, but uh, uh, the community have uh, expressed the, uh, the desire to, to continue to... Uh, have the parties together uh, in, a, in a community forum like that. Um, I recommend thirdly that council encourages ongoing discussion and consideration through the CEO's forum of the relevant issues, including the underground transmission. Uh, and fourthly, that council provides practical support to any parties that may look to make a submission on the EES once it's placed on exhibition later this year. Thank you, Mr. Nolan. Councillors, do I have a mover? Moved, Councillor Clark. Seconded, Councillor Vance. Councillor Clark. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It, it is most appropriate that Council both reflects the views the community has on this project and communicates them directly to the Minister. Uh, Mr. Nolan's given a pretty extensive list there, and I'll just reiterate a couple of those. I think. None of us want to be back here in five years having to do this again for another power line because what they built is under spec. And that's a that's a significant concern. None of us will want to go through this again in the sense whether it's five years or 10 years. The last one was built 50 years ago. Tony, you might probably want the, we probably weren't in the district at that time, but I was a little eight-year-old, I was a little eight-year-old boy. I remember going and seeing them build that first one. And we can probably handle it in 50 year basis, but I'm not sure we can handle it in 10 in that sense of things. I think this, the second one in that context is how, do, how does the community resolve the underground viability stuff? And I think we have to ask that question to the minister. How does the, the community resolve? We have two competing reports and we're not actually getting any information that actually allows us to say, yes, this is the right one and this one isn't. And we need to point that out to the minister. Um, the other point I think that's worth making is this is not the first time that council has responded to this matter. I think we first started getting submissions from community members about 18 months ago, probably about our September meeting back in 2020, in that sense. And we've written it now a number of times, both to the minister. And we also are represented on the, on the technical panel of the AES, and we continue to put our input in that way. And we'll continue to do that as council in that sense of things. Mr. Nolan, the one thing that's in the recommendation, I think if you could explain a little bit more to the public is your work with the, the other CEOs of the affected councils. If you could just add a little bit of clarity for that, that would be really valuable, please. Uh, thank you, Councillor Clark. Um, the, uh, the CEOs group, uh, you know, really comprised the, the CEOs on the, uh, the length of the, the transmission line. So uh, uh, on a regular basis, we have a, a half an hour uh, meeting on a Friday morning with uh, OSNET. Um, present and uh, uh, we receive uh, any update from uh, the officers from Osnet and provide any feedback to them around issues and uh, and we talk through uh, some of the issues or concerns that are being um, heard within the community to get uh, to get a sense of uh, where things are at and where it um, where it might be heading and uh, and that's uh, a valuable opportunity for uh, you know sharing of that sort of information and to. Uh, talk through some of those um, those relevant issues. Council Vance. Yeah, um, I, I just reiterate Councillor Clark's comments, but I do believe firmly that we must keep hammering away at the Minister to get the understanding that this is hopefully the last time this is going to happen. We can't guarantee that, but they must get it right. You know, we only get maybe one chance, hopefully, at this, and we must get it right. Um, 
we as councillors don't sit in with the CEOs, so I'm not sure of the exact feedback from the other CEOs. It's obvious that Moorable Shire has been very uh, boisterous about it. And, um, I've said along the way there are circumstances in the Pyrenees Shire where you wouldn't go underground, but we've got to get our message through. Where it's possible to go underground, fair enough. You get up around Trollins in the hills there, if you start trying to bury it underground before you know it, the Wimmera River might shift its course. That's all I... We must get those messages through to the Minister. They must understand, that's all. And we must be strong about it. Thank you, Councillor Rex. No, no. The only thing that I try and equate this to us as a council, and if we were going to build a subdivision in any of our towns in the Pyrenees Shire, and we wanted to put overhead power lines around the subdivision, we would get lynched you underground them because that's the current way of doing it. And it's been that way for some time. Now, the people in this situation don't seem to have come to that realisation for power lines. And I take Councillor Clark's point that we need expert opinions as to why it will not work or why it would work. And we're not getting that at the moment. So the minister's the man responsible, the woman responsible, I apologise. Um, and we've got to get our message across for our community's purposes. Uh, Councillors, all those in favour of the recommendation? Thank you very much, Carrie. Councillor reports and general business. Starting off with Councillor Cleo, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I nearly forgot my microphone. Um, we've had, uh, since our last meeting, we've had our Anzac Day ceremonies, of course, and we had um, a beautiful one at Snake Valley at Dawn Service. It was wonderful again to be able to come together as a community. Uh, we weren't able to have a cuppa this year, but we had a, a beautiful service and many attended, many young people too. It was really heartening to see them. And as we remembered all our fallen um, soldiers before us and, and those involved. Uh, the same day, I was privileged to go to the Stockyard Hill Avenue of Honour official opening. And now this one was amazing to be able to... Um, to fix up and, and present the, the Avenue of Honour there in such a beautiful way with funding and with, with many people getting on board and involved in that. And it's now a beautiful memorial. There's a great little seat and table there, seats and table there if people would like to go and, and visit. There's also a fantastic information board and we've had a lot of um, suggestions from members of the community who attended that official opening about getting some similar standard ones that are completed across the Shire. It was a, a brilliant board and, and now um, one of our workers uh, here at the council, Terry McAleese, was, uh, played a big part in getting, in getting that up and uh, the whole thing actually, um, getting to the point where it is. Uh, but the information sign was of particular interest to at the memorial there and we would love to be able to, um, uh, to replicate that across the Shire. So kudos to everyone who um, was involved in that. It was a very fun day. There was two up and everything happening there. So the mayor and I were able to attend that and, and it really was just a fantastic day and for an incredibly important reason we were there. Uh, this week I was uh, at some initial meetings looking at getting markets started in Snake Valley. There's an interest, a group of, of craftspeople and also other people just interested in being able to activate the community there. Um, which was really fabulous. And we've not only had that, we've had interest from across the Shire uh, from people involved in other markets, um, in, particular, in particular Sarah Beaumont, who's been involved with the Bofin and Avoca markets, uh, looking at possibilities there. So that's very exciting for down um, in our area. Uh, I was also going to be attending this Sunday a dinner um, for Wings, for an organisation called Wings for Hope. There was a brunch. Um, uh, one of our residents, Virginia, and, and others involved. Um, this is a fantastic cause that uh, assists victims and their families of domestic violence. So it assists them not just to get out of those situations, but support to, um, to grow in their own autonomy again. 
Um, so that was cancelled due to COVID, but hopefully will it will happen again. So anyone that can come along to support that would be wonderful. That will be held at the Beaufort Football, uh, the Beaufort uh, Community Centre. Um, but that will, um, I'm not sure when that will happen. So please look out for that. I mentioned that because this week is Volunteers Week. So again, a shout out to all those volunteers. Another one I did just want to pull out um, that was celebrated at the Beaufort <coughs> Football Club um, recently, and that's Jim Marnie, who's a, who was a Mount Emu resident for many, many years, a farmer um, out our way, but he was recognised for his many, many years of timekeeping, so that uh, so the, that's uh, being named in his honour. And, um, and I just want to highlight these people who do these things year after year, week after week, um, they volunteer their time and, and we really appreciate um, all that work that goes out there. So to all those volunteers this week, to those from SES, CFA, um, sports coaches, like everyone out there, those people that do the little things, um, just helping their neighbours out as well. We want to remember everyone who volunteers their time um, and their commitment to others. So thank you to all those people across the Shire. That's all from me. Thank you, Councillor Keogh. Councillor Ferrari. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, uh, we had the Cancellor Cup out at Crowlands, and uh, what I can say is um, it's a lovely little spot out there, but I do encourage people, we do broadcast where we're going, people know in advance, so I do encourage people, please make the effort to turn up to those cuppers if you've got some issues or you want to discuss some things with the councillors or the CEO, or if you just want to come along and have a chat, please make the effort. We do make the effort, so please come along and say good day. and uh, if you've got some issues, it's nice to talk about it face-to-face -face rather than um, through some other means. So um, please make uh, use of those couple of days. Um, had a uh, meeting uh, regarding the band retainer where some um, um, constituents in um, both had, uh, had some concerns around the uh, works that were being undertaken. So uh, myself, the Mayor and the CEO and some officers and some um, members of the public had a meeting and a discussion and we resolved those issues and it was a really, really good meeting. Um, and, you know, that's what it's all about. If, you, if you've got an issue, please speak up and we can have a meeting or we can have a discussion about it and, and we can sort usually uh, sort things <laughs> out or we can, uh, we can agree to disagree. But most times we certainly do um, come to an agreement. We sort the match, which we did in this case, which was great. Um, I attended the Paddock to Plate um, event, which was up at, uh, up at the Central Goldfields Reserve. And uh, the, the concept of that is... Uh, where uh, local produce, produce is used uh, to prepare a meal for the people. And I think there was around about 80 odd people up there and it was a fantastic evening. The meal was fantastic. Um, and it just really showcased some of the fantastic um, produce um, that we do have locally. Um, and, and it was really, really well um, represented. And um, Sarah Kittley prepared a magnificent meal. And thank you to all those people that supported her and were waiting on the tables on the evening. Um, attended the secondary college in relation to the Anzac tribute, um, uh, which is really good. And, and they embraced that really well and showed genuine, genuine respect for young people, which I think is really, really pleasing. And one thing they did do, it was, I, I call it a poppy wall rug, but they had a rug on the wall about the size of that um, board up there. And it was had all these individually made poppies attached to it and it was just absolutely amazing and the stories that they told and some um, um, stories about um, um, you know excerpt, excerts from books and things uh, it was just amazing and I was just I was pleasantly surprised at how respectful those kids are and the understanding they did have Anzac so that's really good. Um, the only other thing is uh, I had a couple of discussions with constituents on a range of topics and just Friday this Friday, the 20th, is uh, walk to school day. So um, I encourage um, people to um, take part in that. And if you can, walk, walk to school with your children or with your nieces, nephews, or the uncle and aunties or uh, grandparents take part in that. So uh, I really encourage that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Councillor Clark. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, 
a few roads matters around our area and a couple of planning matters, mostly down Snake Valley. I've been down doing planning stuff, which is all good. Um, Anzac Day, I attended the dawn service here in Beaufort and also had the chance with Councillor Cad today to meet with a couple of the RSL people about the, let's hope, imminent return of the Krupp gun to the fully restored to the um, area there, which is really good. Um, we had the annual general meeting of the Highlands Lend, which I represent council on, and we had a chance to have our belated 20th birthday party that we missed last year. So that was quite good. The, the food the food wasn't particularly good after 12 months, but the wine was still okay. <laughs> so that was good. So you're 20 or 21? Well, we're technically 21, but you hate to miss a party. So we're actually going to save the 21st for next year. So that's good. Um, with my MAV stuff, I've been travelling the state a bit in that sense of things. And just one interesting statistic, um, Mr. Mayor, when I went to Wangaratta, I said, how are you going with the housing price? He said, we're actually all right. He said, we, we put all these blocks aside. We bargained on them going at 100 a year. They're going at 300 a year. To give you some sense of the demand, he said, we're a community that's meeting the demand for people buying has, but the demand's three times what we predicted it would be. Um, so that's a really interesting place to be um, in that sense. Uh, I've also been doing a number of videos for the federal election and been quite involved in that stuff here. Um, and just finally, a thank you to councillors and council officers uh, who were at Warbler last week to meet with the Bowls Club. Um, you know, we've spent $300,000 on the new green. We've got, a, we've got something that looks a million bucks. It's absolutely fabulous, but it certainly makes the club rooms look a bit, a bit shabby in that sense. And not only are they a bit shabby, they are actually getting towards the end of their life. And they were very, very pleased to hear from council that yet we understand that this is, this is almost very much near our top priority in terms of building and repair and the council is going to work on that. So um, I'm having more conversations with them and we'll keep working those things along with that group. But again, thanks to council officers and councillors for coming and having a look at the club rooms last week. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Councillor Vance. Uh, like all other councillors, so I had the privilege of attending the dawn service at Landsborough. Uh, quite memorable one for me, actually. Uh, it was still dark when we started at six o'clock. And uh, for those that haven't read the local paper, there were a couple of kookaburras, maybe three or four even, that sort of woke up to the fact that there was something going on. They were laughing away early in the piece and then the magpies joined in. And as daylight arrived and the piper come down the hill, we had a flyover of about 200 corellas. So it was <laughs> quite something, um, quite memorable for me. It just shows you that nature has an important part in our life. Um, we had a gunfire breakfast as usual afterwards up behind the resource centre and they have this special jug of milk with something added to it that <laughs> puts a bit of a tickle in your throat. So that was uh, very good. Um, like to uh, recognise the volunteers' work that's coming up. All small communities rely on our volunteers to make our life that much better. So I just, like Tanya, would like to recognise all the volunteers that put in. There's a few professionals out there that help also. And uh, I had a Moonabell Tennis AGM. Um, it was interesting to hear the comments. There, were, there weren't many people at that AGM, but they now joined the Ararat Association. They pulled out of the Maribara Comp and joined Ararat and just made the comment how much more enjoyable it was to play against the smaller communities like Crowlands and Buanga. And, um, there was one Ararat team, Lansborough over team, of course, and Elmhurst. And they really enjoyed it, they said. So that was good to hear. Uh, I had a Timber Town meeting in Melbourne where we uh, actually got back together for the first time for two years. It's been in Zoom meetings up until then. Wasn't attended by a large number of people for different reasons, but we did recognise the late Malcolm Hole, who had been a uh, stalwart for the timber Towns industry for a long time. And it was good to go back to his favourite restaurant and have a meal the night before. So that was quite enjoyable. And I also had an RCV meeting via Zoom. 
Um, there were a couple of outcomes from that meeting that um, we, we had a, a, a a motion put forward that we write to the MPs from both the uh, government and the opposition to get a uh, further commitment to funding for ongoing costs. As we all know, you can't run these events or groups without funding. We did get approval of uh, some funding that was due about six months ago and has finally come through and we've got to equate that by the end of next month. So. You get half a million dollars and you've got to <laughs> equate it by the end of June. It's a pretty short and tough task, but anyway, our Secretariat's doing a great job. Um, there was a motion brought forward by the Chair that we write to the uh, appropriate Minister with regard to the release of dingoes into the Grampians. And I had much pleasure in seconding that motion because I'm not sure who the dingo was that dreamt up the idea, but I... Pretty sure they had two leaves, not four. Um, and relating to the cuppa, we're actually going to Barclay on the 7th of June and I appeal to the people of Barclay to come along and talk to the councillors. Um, it's very uh, heartwarming for me to know that the primary school at Navarre three years ago was down to one student. It's currently at 19. And I believe it's on the back of quite a few new entities that have come into the Barclay area and they've chosen Navarro as their primary school. So it's seeing our communities move forward as the times we're living in. And uh, there's a little bit of housing available around Barclay and it's been snapped up as quick as along with some other permits that we've granted through council also. So, And uh, the other... Good bit of news is that we now have a new police officer residing in Lansborough as of this week. So that's good to note. And just one question, Jim, I might relate to you, and that is with regards to the transformation project. Are we involved with Central Goldfields? Yep. And we're making full use of that. Yep. Uh, just through you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thanks, Councillor Bans, for that question. The um, the Rural Council Transformation Project was one that um, <coughs> um, the state government had offered uh, an opportunity for councils to make um, uh, um, submissions uh, for some of the funding that's on offer, and we uh, certainly joined with Central Goldfields Council in making a submission uh, for a project that's in total five hundred thousand um, dollars to do some transformational work um, uh, of our systems that we, we use and particularly in respect of our finance system and our customer relationship management system. So uh, uh, at this point in time, the decisions around that funding have not formally been announced, but it is understood that uh, there is support from government to progress further with that. So. We're really hopeful to get that formalised in uh, in a decision and in a in a formal agreement, so that we can move forward with uh, with getting underway with that that digital uh, transformation. Thanks, Councillor Vance. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Vance. Um, I attended a number of Anzac Day events, and uh, they were all very very pleasing. Dawn service always takes your breath away. It's a wonderful time of day to be remembering those. And morning service in Avoca brought to me the, ch the school children. Now, they were on holidays at that time, but they all turned up in their uniforms. The school teachers were there as well. These are the people that are going to follow on from us. And if we train them, if we help them to understand the importance, that day is secured for a long, long time to come. And then in the afternoon, my wife and I and Councillor Keogh and some others went to Stockyard Hill to the memorial that's been created down there. And I totally agree with you, Councillor Keogh. It was a wonderful day. It's been created beautifully down there with the memorial and the um, picnic table and whatever and the board is brilliant 
It's something that I had no idea any of the information that was on there. And all there is is some bluestone um, remnants of the hotel that was there. And those boards spread around other remnant locations in the Shire where important, I think, would be something that we could do one or two a year and, and get them placed in places where travellers can pass, have a look and understand the areas that we're talking about. Um, with Councillor Ferrari, we had the band rotunda discussions and I agree, we, we do far better when we sit down around a table and face-to-face -face discuss these things with people and try and iron out their understandings of what we do and our understandings of what their issues are. It makes it so much easier. And it was a good result all round. It even got me to go and have a look at the band rotunda today. And uh, it is a formidable building. And the Warbra Bowls Club. Now, not to put too fine a point on it, it's almost as old as I am. So it certainly needs some work, much the same as myself. And uh, yeah, I hope that we are able to help them in a similar situation to the way we help them with the bowling green. Councillors, there being no further general business, I'll declare the meeting closed at 7 uh, 12 pm. And thank you all for your attendance. Those viewing, through the streaming. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you found what we've done tonight interesting. Tell all your friends, try and get more to watch next time. Thank you again. Good night.